Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us, or afternoon, depending on which part of the country you're located in. Thank you for joining us this morning on the strategic and restructuring in the Affordable Care Act, the new role of HIV uh, CEO for a webinar. Just a few housekeeping, just a few housekeeping um, points. This presentation will last approximately 45 minutes. We are anticipating, given that there is a lot of content, that it will take probably a little longer. There will be an opportunity for question and answers at the end of the webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, we do encourage you to use the chat feature, which is at the right-hand side of your, of your screen. We anticipate that given the amount of people who will be participating in today's webinar, that we will not be able to get through all the questions. However, we will be, um, we will be providing an educational material or a fact sheet with additional questions that you may have um, throughout the webinar. Also, at the end of the webinar, there will be a survey that is going to pop up once you close the window. Question number eight is an open-ended question where we are encouraging you to uh, ask any type of questions that you may have, and we'll take a note of those so that we are able to address them uh, at a later time, either through emails or through this particular fact sheet. Another reminder is that we will be posting this, um, we'll be recording this webinar and posting it in our website by Monday on ShareAction and ShareAction.hd.org which is on the bottom right-hand side of your, of your screen. And just a brief introduction to Share Action and Share Action HD. Those are two capacity building assistance programs for AIDS Project Los Angeles and are funded under the CDC. We are here to provide any type of technical assistance or any type of services that will help you enhance the services that you provide in your agencies, including today's topic, here are four general areas in which we can uh, um, provide assistance. The first one is organizational infrastructure and program sustainability. The second one is alignment with NCAS of the National HIV AIDS Strategy and high impact HIV prevention. Also services around monitoring and evaluation. And last but not least, evidence-based interventions uh, and polyhealth strategies. So any type of areas that you might need assistance with, we are here to assist you. And you'll have our contact information uh, at the end of the webinar. Just a few acknowledgments, like I mentioned, we are part of H Project Los Angeles. Uh, this is also a collaboration with the Centers for HIV Identification, Prevention, and Treatment Services at UCLA. And once again, we're funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Now we have uh, three presenters today. We have Tom Danahoe, AJ King, and Keisha. So I'll start by by Tom Donahoe. I'm going to give just a brief bio. Tom Donahoe is the Associate Professor of the Family Medicine and Director of the UCLA Pacific AIDS Education and Training Center at the David Geffen Center School of Medicine at UCLA. He's also the Associate Director of the UCLA Center for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention. He has an MBA in Finance from the Amazon School of Management. And in the 1980s, he worked as an investment banker on Wall Street Working, working on corporate measures, uh, mergers and acquisitions. AJ King is a senior um, analyst at UCLA's Department of Family Medicine, as is also a consultant in the field of public health, providing grant writing, facilitation, training, strategic planning, and other organizational development services for a variety of community-based and governmental organizations. AJ worked for many years as a trainer and manager overseeing a national CDC-funded capacity building assistance program for health department and community-based organizations. He has served as a, com a community co-lead uh, co for the CIBA for Health Department's national network as, and as a co-chair of the Los Angeles County HIV Prevention Planning Committee. And last but not least, Keisha McCurdy. She is an Implementation Scientist and Project Director with the UCLA Department of Family Medicine. She has authored intervention manuals for linkage to care and re-engagement in care for men and transgender women living with HIV. She has also co-authored a series of social determinants of health in HIV and HIV and structural level interventions with colleagues from Children's Hospital Los Angeles. Keisha is a CDC-funded capacity building and technical assistance provider for health departments and community-based organizations and has extensive experience working and collaborating with traditionally underrepresented and marginalized communities. She's also a steering committee for co-chair 
of the HIV Prevention Justice Alliance. And without further ado, I'm sitting controls now to our presenters. Tom, you may take over at this time. Great. Thank you, Oscar. And good afternoon and good morning to everyone out there. Thank you all very much for joining us today. So I'll start by quickly reviewing. Sorry, I'm showing you the slide. Hold on one second. Show my screen. There you go. All right. Sorry about that. I'll start by quickly reviewing our objectives for today's webinar. By the end of this webinar, we anticipate that participants will be able to understand the new context within which HIV prevention and care services are delivered, identify possible restructuring strategies for HIV organizations, conduct an agency assessment to determine potential restructuring options, and to access available resources to assist with restructuring efforts. So our agenda then is to discuss the current context in the field of HIV and how it's prompting many of us to consider restructuring. We'll talk about various restructuring strategies and also about how you might get started thinking about restructuring and assessing what changes, if any, might be appropriate for your agency. Then we'll talk about next steps and review some resources. And we'll have a little time at the end to take some questions. OK, so let's start with a quick poll to find out a little bit about who's participating in today's webinar. So Oscar, if you could please pull up the poll. Um, and we're going to ask you to respond to the following question. Of these four categories, which uh, I think you can see, um, which best describes where you work? Is it a CBO, a health department, a federal agency, or other? And if your answer is other, please take a minute to type in the chat box what uh, that other environment might be. So for example, if you work in a clinical setting, please type that in. I'm going to give it a minute here. And Oscar, when you see that the majority of folks have responded, if you can just uh, show us the results, we can give it another minute. OK, AG, I'm about to close it now. OK. Okay, so good. So you should be able to see those poll results. It looks like um, most folks are from CBOs and also health departments, a little bit from federal agencies, and we have um, quite a few representing other environments as well. So thank you. Thank you very much for participating in that poll. It definitely helps us to know who we're talking to out there. All right. So. Let's get started with a quick definition of strategic restructuring. This definition comes from the La Piana consulting firm. And they say this about strategic restructuring. Strategic restructuring occurs when two or more independent organizations establish an ongoing relationship to increase the administrative efficiency and or further the programmatic mission of one or more of the participating organizations through shared, transferred, or combined services, resources, or programs. So we know that some of you out there might be interested in making some major organizational changes, but that many of you may not be. And that's OK. Much of what we're going to be talking about today is meant to be helpful no matter where you are in your process of organizational change, even if you're just looking for a little information. So why do organizations consider restructuring? Typically, to preserve the organization's mission and services, to build capacity and increase efficiency, and or because the context of the work is changing. So this last point about context is very applicable to us who work in HIV in 2013, and, and really to any of us who work in the broader public health or healthcare fields. So let's take a few minutes to consider what we mean by context. Over the past two to three years, there have been some significant changes in the field of HIV. In 2010, the Affordable Care Act was signed and set into motion, and the first ever national HIV AIDS strategy was released by President Obama and the Office of National AIDS Policy. 
in 2011, there were a number of scientific breakthroughs in the field, one of the most significant being the results of the HIV Prevention Trials Network 052 study, which we'll talk more about in a few minutes. The CDC also introduced high impact prevention and released a new health department funding opportunity announcement. This funding opportunity in many ways redefined how we and our federal partners conceptualized HIV prevention. And importantly, for this funding cycle, the CDC also updated its geographic funding allocations among health departments. Finally, in 2011, a model known as the HIV treatment cascade was popularized on a national level by an article written by Dr. Edward Gardner and his colleagues. We'll also be talking more about the treatment cascade in the next few minutes. In 2012, we saw recommendations that antiretroviral therapy, or ART, should be provided to all HIV-infected individuals, regardless of their CD4 count, and that clinicians should screen everyone 15 to 64 years old for HIV infection, regardless of risk. And now, in 2013, we find ourselves preparing for 2014, when the Affordable Care Act will be fully implemented. So a lot has happened, and there's even more on the horizon. So let's take a few minutes to take a closer look at some of these events. Many of you by now are probably well aware of the National HIV AIDS Strategy, so we'll just highlight a couple key points here. The strategy was released in 2010 and outlines three broad goals, to reduce new HIV infections, increase access to care, and improve health outcomes for people living with HIV, and to reduce HIV-related disparities. To reduce new infections, the strategy directs us to, among other things, use a combination of evidence-based approaches. And one of the benchmarks the strategy identifies is by 2015 to increase the percentage of people living with HIV who know their status from 79% to 90%. To increase access to care and improve health outcomes for people living with HIV, the benchmarks include increase the proportion of newly diagnosed people who are linked to clinical care within three months of their diagnosis from 65% to 85%, increase the proportion of Ryan White clients who are in continuous care from 73% to 80%, and increase the percentage of Ryan White clients with permanent housing from 82% to 88%. To reduce HIV-related disparities and in health inequities, the strategy calls for us to increase the proportion of HIV-diagnosed gay and bisexual men, blacks, and Latinos with undetectable viral load by 20%. Now, if you think about it, when the strategy first came out, I think a lot of us, especially those of us that are not clinically oriented, didn't think much in terms of viral load. But now this concept of viral load with respect to undetectable viral load or community viral load, et cetera, is something that we hear about quite frequently, which is yet another indication of how much the context of our work has changed. And here is another very significant event on our timeline. In 2011, the HPTN 052 clinical trial, an international HIV prevention trial sponsored by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, found that HIV-positive individuals who took antiretrovirals were 96% less likely to transmit the virus to their uninfected partners than those who delayed treatment. So this study then convincingly demonstrated that ART could not only treat, but also prevent the transmission of HIV. So I'm betting that we've all heard a lot of this terminology lately with respect to the field of HIV, that we are experiencing a paradigm shift or a changing landscape. And how about this one? It's a game changer. Or we're experiencing a sea change. And we're now in a new era of HIV prevention and care. And it's mostly been this concept of treatment as prevention that's responsible for the increase in usage of these terms. And really, if you think about it, it was the result of the HBTN 052 study more than anything else that was responsible for this paradigm shift. One more look at exactly how the context has changed over the last few years. So the year was 2010. 
and HIV prevention consisted mostly of testing and health ed risk reduction. With respect to testing, we talked a lot about targeted testing for high-risk groups, and a lot of testing was done in non-clinical settings. And for ATRR, we had the CDC's DEBI, or Diffusion of Effective Behavioral Interventions Project, in full force. Care services in 2010 were largely Ryan White funded and were provided largely in ASOs and HIV clinics. So fast forward three years, and we now have, or are planning to have, not prevention, not care per se, but a continuum of HIV services. And we're focused on the following, testing and diagnosis that is both routine and targeted and occurring more and more in clinical settings. We have linkage to and engagement in care and the provision of essential services largely to ensure linkage and retention. We have combination prevention utilizing biomedical, behavioral, and structural interventions. We talk a lot about treatment as prevention, TLC plus, and test and treat. And our services are increasingly Medicaid funded and expanding to federally qualified health centers and patient-centered medical homes. Again, a lot has changed. So we mentioned the treatment cascade earlier, and here's the article published in 2011 by Gardner and colleagues that popularized the model. And for those, of, for those of you who haven't seen it, here's the HIV AIDS treatment cascade. It's a simple way to depict the estimated number of people living with HIV who know their status, who are linked to HIV care, who are retained in HIV care, who need treatment, who are receiving treatment, and who are adherent to their treatment and ultimately have an undetectable viral load. Ideally, we would want everyone living with HIV to have an undetectable viral load so that the first bar on the left and the last bar on the right would be the same height. But we can see, as we look at the cascade, that people are dropping off along the way. Roughly 20% remain undiagnosed. Many who know their status are not always linked to care. And when they are linked, many may not stay engaged in care. Not everyone who needs art receives it or is able to remain adherent and have an undetectable viral load. So later in the webinar, we will see how this tool has, has been used to help shape services and how you can potentially use it to strengthen your programming. But right now, Tom is going to talk to you about the impact of the Affordable Care Act on HIV services. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. This is Tom Donahoe. And I'm going to take us through another paradigm change, which is the Affordable Care Act. I'm going to look at it overall, and I'm going to talk about how it changes HIV services. So overall, health reform will bring health insurance to 32 million people. 20 million more people will get their health care at community health clinics, which will actually see an $11 billion uh, expansion in new investments and uh, new clinics. In states that accept Medicaid expansion, non-disabled adults who make less than 133% of the federal poverty level will now qualify for Medicaid. There will be subsidies for those who make between 100 and 400% of the federal poverty level to purchase private insurance through state exchanges, yet there will still be about 23 million people in the country without health insurance. So what about HIV? The Affordable Care Act promotes HIV, STD, and viral hepatitis testing and directs more funding of preventive services, many of which will be free to patients. In terms of HIV medical services, many people living with HIV who currently don't have insurance and get their HIV medical care paid through the Ryan White program will get insurance, both through Medicaid expansion and through private insurance through state exchanges. But it's also important to know that Ryan White is the payer of last resort. So by congressional charge, Ryan White uh, is the payer of last resort. So if a person has medical insurance, that insurance must be used to pay for their HIV medical care. So as the Affordable Care Act expands insurance, many people living with HIV will move, for example, from Ryan White to Medicaid or state private exchange insurance for payment of their HIV and other medical care. This will expand coverage for many HIV-infected patients as it will include services like emergency room care and non-HIV-related medical care. Now, Ryan White will still be available for those who will remain uninsured after implementation of the Affordable Care Act, and they'll also be available for wraparound services not included in programs like Medicaid or the state exchanges, for example, adult dental care. So the role of uh, HIV CBOs uh, will still be very important in helping patients navigate these changes. So as you heard earlier, I have a background in investment banking in the private world, so I thought I'd give a quick analogy about these landscape changes through private world eyes that AJ was talking about. 
So there's been a lot of paradigm changes in HIV, but I'm going to look at the paradigm change that the Internet caused, for example, at newspapers and how newspapers do business. So we all know that in the business world, we hear about strategic restructuring. They often call it mergers and acquisitions every day on the radio and television. So the goals are often complex, and maximizing profit is an ultimate objective, but they are often responding to these paradigm changes. So think, for example, how the Internet has changed the newspaper industry. So this side-by-side -side example shows how you might advertise a home for sale using the Internet versus one of your city's newspapers. It's expensive to place one small ad one time in the newspaper. While the Internet offers many free places to place real estate ads, you can even put pictures, movies on your website, and all of it can be updated. Many of these Internet services are actually free, like Craigslist. So many of these newspapers did not adapt to these new and profound changes, and they simply had to close their doors as their business models were no longer relevant. So if you look at the free advertising services that Craigslist um, offer, you can see how newspaper classified ad sales plummeted. Those of you who still get the print edition of your newspaper have probably noticed this when you pick it up in the morning. It is likely much smaller than you remember from just a few years ago because the classified section is actually much smaller. Has this meant the end of the newspaper industry? Well, for some papers it did but it didn't for those who adapted to the new paradigm of the Internet. So how did newspapers survive? They survived by adapting to the new paradigm. So how did they do this? Well, a lot of newspapers actually merged to reduce cost and to have more resources to address the new paradigm. Probably most of your local papers, wherever you are in the country, now have a website edition, like this is the Los Angeles Times, which has its website edition. And then there's papers you know, like a very award-winning paper uh, in New Orleans, the Times Picayune, uh, that actually right now, you may have seen this on 60 Minutes, is going to a three-day-a-week printed version just to help drive people to their website. So consultants sometimes refer to strategic restructuring as taking competition out of the closet for the nonprofit world. So now Keisha is going to describe restructuring strategies for the nonprofit environment. Thanks, Tom. So AJ mentioned earlier La Piana Consulting. This is an agency that's dedicated to helping nonprofits become stronger and more effective through collaboration. So just revisiting their definition of restructuring, uh, strategic restructuring, which is the definition that we're using for the purposes of this webinar here, strategic restructuring occurs when two or more independent organizations establish an ongoing relationship to increase administrative efficiency and or further their programmatic mission of one or more of the participating organizations through shared, transferred, or combined services, resources, or programs. So there are two common types of restructuring strategies. We've got a strategic alliance and integration. So here on the screen now, we've got sort of a partnership matrix. This, is, this graph is a visual depiction of the different types of restructuring strategies for nonprofit organizations. The x-axis along the bottom of the slide shows the strategies on an autonomy integration scale. And then on the right, you see the strategies that call for more integration. Y-axis on the left side of the scale shows the strategies on a program administrative scale. And collaboration here on your far left allows for a great amount of autonomy and usually has a programmatic focus. Collaboration isn't technically considered a restructuring strategy, but it's an important aspect of strategic restructuring, so it's included here on the matrix. Strategic alliances are what we see here in this middle column. And integration on the far right, these are two common types of re restructuring strategies and each type has a few different strategy methods, and we'll talk about those in just a moment. So strategic alliances. In a strategic alliance, decision-making power is shared or transferred and is agreement-driven. So each agency still maintains a certain amount of autonomy. And there are three key types of strategic alliances. Administrative consolidation, joint programming, and joint advocacy. In administrative consolidation, this is a restructuring that includes sharing, exchanging, um, or contracting administrative functions to increase the administrative efficiency 
of one or more of the organizations involved. So by this I mean functions like accounting, human resources, information systems, marketing, purchasing, things along those lines. So an example of this might be a consortium of community-based primary health care clinics might consolidate their financial and information man management functions while each clinic continues to serve a distinct geographic and ethnic constituency and to maintain a separate board of directors and management. Now when we think about joint programming, joint programming is a restructuring that includes the joint launching and managing of one or more programs to further the programmatic mission of the participating organizations. So an example for this might be if the Trevor Project partnered with a local LGBT youth organization to create and manage a drop-in space while continuing to operate their existing organizations and programs independently. That might be an example of, of joint programming. And finally, we have joint advocacy. A joint advocacy effort occurs when two or more organizations combine their advocacy efforts either on a single issue or time-limited basis or for ongoing advocacy campaigns. So for example, in this photo from the New York Times in March 1987, AIDS activists from various different groups, agencies, and organizations staged a die-in to demand quicker government approval for, for drugs that might combat AIDS. And our second key method is integration. So there are four major forms of integration. Mergers and acquisitions are probably the most well-known, and that was something that, that Tom referenced earlier when he was talking about the corporate world, but there are actually three other forms of integration that might be useful for you all to take into account when considering strategic restructuring and how that might fit in with your agency. So the first here is management service organization, or an MSO. So an MSO is an integration that includes the creation of a new organization in order to integrate administrative functions and to increase the administrative efficiency of participating organizations. So for example, two mental health centers in Illinois created and jointly governed an, F, an MSO that provides administrative support to both organizations while still allowing them to maintain complete programmatic independence. So through that MSO, the organizations share a controller. They also share a director of management information services as well as a director of revenue development and managed care and, and their financial staff. A joint venture corporation is an integration that includes the creation of a new organization to further a specific administration, an administrative or programmatic end of two or more of the organizations. And in this setup, partner organizations actually share governance of the new organization that's created. So for example, here we might think about a, a child welfare organization in the Midwest initiating a joint venture whose mission is to develop and uh, service client tracking software for human service organizations. So they created five different agencies came together to create this service client tracking software, and all five partners actually sit on the joint venture corporation's board, and together they provide the community with a much needed resource. Parent subsidiary structure is an integration that combines some of the partner's administrative functions and programmatic services. So the goal with this method is to really increase administrative efficiency and program quality of one or more of the organizations through the creation of a new organization or the designation of an existing organization, which in this case would be termed a parent to oversee administrative functions and programmatic services of other organizations, also termed the subsidiaries. So for example, a Boys and Girls Club and a YMCA might form a parent subsidiary structure that functions like a merger, but it allows both partners to maintain their corporate structures and thus you know, their original endowments. So, Another example might be two multi-purpose health agencies in Ohio forming a parent subsidiary structure that can preserve the organization's programmatic autonomy while allowing the partners to pursue some programmatic goals together and also providing improved administrative support. So P 
parent subsidiary structures are often utilized when two organizations want to do a merger but can't accomplish that immediately due to contractual obligations. So parent subsidiary structure can be put in place temporarily until transferable issues are resolved. And then finally, the probably more popular and well-known method is, would be mergers or acquisitions. So merger and acquisition is an integration that includes the integration of all the programmatic and administrative functions to increase administrative efficiency and program impact of one or more organizations. So a merger occurs when two or more organizations are dissolved and they newly create a corporation that includes some or all of the resources or admin functions or programs of the original organization. So an example of this here is the Colorado AIDS Project. In 2008, five Colorado AIDS service organizations and four funding partners committed to a multi-year process aimed at strengthening HIV AIDS advocacy and services statewide. With grant support from AIDS United, which is formerly the National AIDS Fund, they came together to determine how to sustain their services in an increasingly uncertain funding environment. The effort resulted in a four-way merger that was made official in 2011 and continues to evolve as an opportunity to better serve people living with HIV AIDS and their family. So the new agency is called Colorado AIDS Project, or CAP. And you, if you're interested in actually reading more about this case study, it's available on the La Piana website. And we'll give a link at the, at the end of this presentation with a list of the resources. And then to differentiate between merger and acquisition, an acquisition occurs when one corporation is, an, is dissolved. Um, that would be the acquired corporation with all of their activities and resources transferred into the surviving agency. So with a selection of an acquisition form of consolidation doesn't limit identity and branding. So now that we've walked through each of the different methods, I'm going to hand it back over to AJ, who's going to walk through, who's going to help us think about how we can assess what's right for our agencies. Great. Thank you, Keisha. So the question is, if you are interested in making some organizational changes to align with a new paradigm in HIV, how do you start? Well, minimally, you can read more about the impact of, of ACA on HIV services. And there are definitely a lot of great resources out there, some of which we're going to touch on in a few minutes. Two other things you can do are to apply the treatment cascade locally and begin to assess your readiness for restructuring or making other changes. So let's talk briefly about those last two items now. So we showed you the treatment cascade a minute ago, and we're now going to show you some examples of how it's been utilized at the local level. So first, we want to acknowledge that while Gardner's article in 2011 introduced this framework to a national audience, way back in 2009, our friends in Washington, D.C. were using it to understand their local epidemic, as is evidenced by this article cited on the slide. So let's take a look at how it's been applied across the country. Here is Iowa's Cascade for 2011. And here's a slide from Connecticut. Here is Illinois, and here is Los Angeles County. So notice that they're all that they all vary slightly, but they all ultimately measure the continuum of care from HIV diagnosed to viral suppression. And of course, there are lots of other jurisdictions that are cascading, if you will, but these are just uh, a few examples. Here are some slides from the CDC looking at various stages of the continuum of care by transmission category by sex, by race, ethnicity, and looking at who was prescribed art and had viral suppression by age group. Well, here is an example of how Illinois compares where they are on the treatment cascade to where they need to be to reach the national HIV AIDS strategy goals we talked about earlier. And here is how they've planned to progress towards those goals year by year from 2010 to 2015. So here's a real simple method for you to begin to utilize the treatment cascade to help determine what role your agency can play in this new context. The first step is to find out, if you don't know already, what the treatment cascade looks like in your jurisdiction. 
The second step is to not just look at the picture, but to read between the lines and understand what the picture is telling you. So for instance, where is the biggest drop-off? Who's not getting linked? Who's not engaged? Uh, who's not adhering to medication? Then thinking about your agency's strengths, figure out what you can do to, to address the gaps. So for example, let's say this is what the cascade looks like in your jurisdiction. As you can see, there's a major gap between people getting linked to care and retained in care. And you find out that a lot of those folks who are not engaged in, in care tend to have substance abuse disorders. Your agency is known for providing quality services for substance users. So clearly, your services are needed to ensure that those who are linked to care become engaged in care. That's a strong selling point that can easily be described by using your local treatment cascade. Let's talk now about some preliminary assessment steps that you can take to determine how ready your organization may be to implement some changes. Please keep in mind that these assessment stages that we'll cover are adapted from a variety of sources. The first stage is to assess organizational readiness. The second stage is to assess feasibility of change. The third, to assess the organization's internal and external environments. And the last stage is to assess the organizational culture. Here are some key questions to ask to assess organizational readiness for change. Is there agreement among the organization's leaders about the strategic vision for the organization and about the threats and opportunities facing the organization? Is there mutual respect and healthy communication between the board and staff? And how about between leadership and staff? Is the organization comfortable with risk taking? And have they had success with taking risks in the past? Keep in mind that this is perhaps the most important stage in the process where people are encouraged to be very open and honest about their fears. To assess feasibility of change, you might want to ask, does the organization need incremental or strategic change, meaning less risky collaborations or some programmatic adjustments versus mergers or more formal partnerships? And how will internal and external stakeholders react to proposed changes? And does the organization have the capacity to implement change? Stage three is an assessment of the organization's internal and external environments. This is where a SWOT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis is very appropriate. Internally, you, you want to look for strengths and weaknesses in the following areas. Programs, staff and volunteers, funding, leadership, and infrastructure. Externally, you want to look at opportunities and threats with respect to programming. So for example, is your programming duplicative with respect to other agencies? And what are the opportunities and threats with respect to funders, to policies, and to new technologies? The last stage is assessing your organizational culture. The information you gain here will be especially relevant as you enter into partnerships with other agencies. You can assess your organizational culture by observing and describing the skills that tend to be valued, the rights and rituals of the agency, the style of the staff, how decisions are made, how communication happens or doesn't happen, the structure, meaning is it hierarchical or flat, the agency's core values, and the management style. And while we're talking about making changes, one thing that we think has to change is the way many of us think about HIV services. Largely, as a result of siloed funding, we have all thought of HIV prevention, care, and treatment as mostly separate, although related services. And we're suggesting that we stop doing that. We think that to keep pace with the new paradigm of HIV services, it might behoove us to conceptualize the collective services that we provide differently, where all treatment and care can also serve to prevent HIV. Having said that, I want to give a shout out to the Los Angeles County planning bodies that have adopted this conceptual model as part of their continuum of HIV prevention and care. And now I'm going to pass it back over to Tom, who's going to talk to you about next steps and resources. Thank you, AJ. So what can AIDS community-based organizations and the people who make them work do? Well, the first thing you can do is make sure that you and your organization are increasingly integrated into the primary care medical services of your community, if you're not already. Often these are federally qualified health centers and community health centers. Sometimes AIDS community-based organizations do excellent work, but in the silo of excellence, like AJ was discussing. So increasingly, interventions, including important prevention, linkage, and retention services will need to be integrated with clinical care. Integration does not have to mean co-location. 
Indeed, sometimes co-located services are not integrated, but organizations can no longer work in silos of excellence. What about helping to fund strategic restructuring efforts? The next few slides will show websites of local, regional, and national resources to help fund your strategic restructuring efforts. This is in no way a complete list. So the first one is the Center for Civic Partnerships. The Center for Civic Partnerships mission is to provide leadership and management support to build healthier communities and more effective nonprofit organizations. They offer strategic and sustainability training and consultation for nonprofits and a low-cost sustainability toolkit. The Dyson Foundation Strategic Restructuring Initiative is designed to help mid-Hudson Valley, New York nonprofit organizations become stronger through collaboration, consolidation, or outright merger. The foundation in 2010 alone awarded grants totaling $436,000 for strategic restructuring initiatives. The Community Foundation for Greater Atlanta, for example, offers a strategic restructuring fund. The purpose of the strategic restructuring fund is to provide funds or management consulting services to support nonprofits as they assess, negotiate, design, and implement substantial strategic restructuring efforts. And we've talked a lot today about La Piana Consulting. La, Pia La Piana Consulting is viewed by many experts and community-based organizations across the country as being the leader in the field for strategic restructuring for nonprofits. Last year, La Piana partnered with several other organizations to fund multi-phase initiatives to strengthen nonprofits in Los Angeles. A number of AIDS community-based organizations are currently in phase two, which is determining readiness and next steps of this initiative. The Lodestar Foundation, in partnership with the Foundation Center, provides a nonprofit collaboration database as a resource for anyone seeking real-life examples of how nonprofits work together. You can find information for more than 650 nonprofit collaborations at this website. So as an organization or an individual, no matter what course your community-based organization takes, you will want to learn more about the Affordable Care Act and HIV. An excellent free resource is HRSA's, or I should say the Ryan White HIV AIDS program, which is located within HRSA, their Target Center website. Target stands for Technical Assistance, Resources, Guidance, Education, and Training. So the Ryan White, uh, the Target website um, covers a lot of things you can see from this. Uh, this is the home page. And one of the things you can see there is the 2012 Ryan White Grantee Meeting slide presentations. So, uh, Ryan White program grantees through the HIV AIDS Bureau meet every two years in Washington. The last meeting was in late November and featured many excellent presentations on HIV and the Affordable Care Act. The slides from these found presentations can be found here at the Target Center. Additionally, the Target Center will continue to monitor integration of the Affordable Care Act into HIV care and publish reports, advisories, and tools. And then finally, the CDC has a wealth of information on their websites about many of the changes to the landscape we discussed today. For example, at effectiveinterventions.org, you can read more about high impact prevention, linkage to care strategies, biomedical and behavioral interventions, and a lot more. So here's just a partial listing of the resources we've talked about today and the contact information for myself, for Keisha McCurtis, and for A.J. King. And we're now going to uh, ask Oscar to give us the last poll. OK, give me just one second. Sure. All right, at this time, people should be able to see the options on their screen. Please go ahead and select your option. Given these paradigm changes in HIV, and now the three presenters are all on speakerphone, given these paradigm changes, how well prepared do you feel you are personally? So that not very prepared, somewhat prepared, very prepared, or I don't know, or I'm unsure.
And we'll give it just a few more seconds before we close the poll. At this time, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Tom, let me know if you can see the result. Okay, so we can see that most people feel somewhat prepared. There's about 12% of people who think they're not very prepared. Um, and then about equal numbers who think they're very prepared are uh, unsure. So um, we're glad that we had the call today so that we hopeful, hopefully this made you feel a little bit more prepared. And so when we take questions and answers, uh, we do have 218 people, according to my reading, on this. So we're going to ask that people type in their questions. And we're also going to ask that you, in addition to asking your questions, that you take the time to write down what questions you have in the evaluation for the webinar, which will be sent to you. So the question number eight is an open-ended open -ended question. So if you write out your questions there, we will be compiling a list of frequently asked questions and putting that um, posted to the website along with this presentation. So the presentation will be available Monday at the Shared Action website. And then that frequently asked question, if we get enough, uh, probably in a couple weeks. And I want to take the time to thank the presenters, uh, AJ, Tom, and Keisha, for today's presentation. I think that's a very useful presentation and very timely, especially for the times of new directions that we're all facing. So thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. Let me just remind participants that this, uh, this webinar is being recorded, and it will be made available by Monday on our website, shareaction.org and shareactionhd.org, which you can see at the bottom of your screen on your right-hand side. Uh, before I start asking some of the questions, one of the most common questions that we were asked um, to any of the presenters is, where can people go to find the treatment cascade for their particular um, geographic areas? Oh, that's a good question. I'll start with me, and I think the other people want to answer as well. But I think you want to start with your local health jurisdiction. And so that's another really important point, is if you're a community-based organization that's not already part of the planning process, whether it's the Ryan White Planning Council, if you have one, um, but certainly you want to check with your local health jurisdiction. And if they don't have one, maybe help develop one with them. Uh, AJ or Keisha, do you want to add anything? I would just add that, yeah, a lot of planning bodies also um, have, have the data that they can apply to the treatment cascade. But if your health uh, department doesn't have it, urge them to get it because, you know, it, it's not difficult. And one of the things that I can also add to presenters is you can go ahead and follow up with any of us at the end of the webinar. You have our contact information in your confirmation email, and we can elaborate a little bit more. Now, one of the things that was mentioned during the, the webinar was that um, with the health care reform, Ryan One funds will only be used for those who remain uninsured and for wraparound services. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that, please? Sure. Well, we could spend probably an entire webinar on that, so we <laughs> just really wanted to give the biggest highlights. So even, for example, I'll take my state of California, which I know the most, which has actually accepted the Medicaid waiver. We're far along the process of um, moving patients into a transitional program that will eventually end up in Medicaid. And so Ryan White, I think the most important thing for people to know is still going to be around. It's not going away. In the state of California, after full implementation of health care reform, we're still going to have millions of people without health insurance. Health care reform is not going to bring uh, health insurance, whether Medicaid or through the insurance exchanges, to everyone. So there will still be people who need Ryan White as their primary uh, provider of HIV medical care. But then for everybody living with HIV, and this will be an important integration role for the planning councils and for the local health jurisdictions, Ryan White will still be there for wraparound services like medical case management, which is an offered in Medicaid, like uh, dental care for adults, which is not offered in Medicaid or through the state insurance programs. So it's still going to be around, and it will be even more important than ever that those Ryan White services are used, think about the cascade, to link people to care and keep people in care. And so I would really encourage the people who had that question, thank you for for caring about how the Affordable Care Act is going to affect people living with HIV. And I would suggest a good starting point is to go to the Target website and look at some of the presentations from the last uh, All Grantees meeting in November 2012. 
Great, thank you, Tom. Now, one of the one of the uh, participants was asking if you have any recommendations on strategies for other underserved communities such as Latino SO, SO, um, SO, sorry, ASOs mergers, especially taking in consideration uh, Latino, the Latino community, such as uh, illegal immigration and so forth. Sure. So I think Keisha went over the importance of advocacy and, and joint advocacy. And so I think if you're working with a special population, uh, you mentioned the example of Latino populations, which are going to have special concerns, not just about people who are undocumented, but will have special concerns about legal recent immigrants because they have a different status under the Affordable Care Act. And so really, community-based organizations can not only think about advocacy, but there's going to be lots of new needs for patient navigation and for benefits counseling. And so, for example, if you're a Latino aid CBO, you may have a lot of staff that are bilingual, that are multicultural, that know your community, that know what the issues are in terms of that cascade for linking people and retaining people in care. But what you need to add to that is partnering with, if you're not doing it already, clinics, community health centers, federally qualified health centers, and looking at the cascade, particularly how do you help link people, how do your testing program has to link people and get them in care, uh, how do you help people retained in care. And so if you can do that, I think that you're really going to um, structure yourself well for adapting to the new paradigm. Now, I've seen through the comments of some of the participants here, they understand that the importance of merging. One of the questions that they pose, however, is that are there any tools or resources to assess what is the most appropriate strategy for their organization? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that a lot of the um, the resources that we you talked about and that we showed you, I mean, there are, you can certainly consult with a number of those consulting firms that can help you through that process. And you can start the process without knowing that, you know, yes, we want to merge or we want to form some kind of other joint partnership. I mean, there's you, you don't need to have that answer when you start. The, the, the process will, will ultimately lead you to that decision. Great, and thank you. Wants to add to the, that too. The, only, the only thing that I would add to that is sort of thinking about who your partners are and trying to bring everyone to the table. That's an important piece as you think about moving forward and whether or not it's a merger, whether or not, like, what type of method you want to do to make sure that you're adapting to the new context of, of HIV prevention. Great. Uh, and I have another question here. Uh, do we need legal advice to start negotiations or conversations with other organizations? Are there any type of legal documents that are needed for that? Well, none of us are lawyers. So. <laughs> <laughs> one of us has an MBA in finance, but no one has a, a JD degree. But I can say from you know looking through all the different models that we've described here that you probably do want to get help, and obviously it's going to depend on the size of your organization. If you're a smaller community-based organization, you may be known as what's a 501c3 or a nonprofit. And so if you're working with a group that's a for-profit organization, obviously you're going to want to get some you know consult there on what it means because those are all federal sort of tax terms. Mm -hmm. And you know we're we're talking about these resources that are available to you because a lot of these Consultants are not uh, inexpensive, and so some of the numbers we looked at were, you know, twenty to fifty thousand dollars just for the consultant to work with a large community-based organization to help them with strategic restructuring, and so that's why we wanted to share with you some resources for applying for grants to do that. We know that some of the community-based organizations that are listening today are probably small, and they may have started from the advocacy community. Um, they may be in a rural setting, but there's still a lot that you can do. For example, that, that um, sustainability toolkit is $60 that was available on that website that I shared. So there's a, a, a wide, wide range of uh, what you can go out there to get in terms of help. I think it's also important to access the resources that you already have in your back pocket. So if you're just beginning discussions, making sure that you're incorporating your board or your strategic committee or your, your steering committee and your group of advisors you may actually have expertise on your on your board or your committee that you weren't necessarily aware of with respect to adapting and, and strategically restructuring, depending on where you are in your conversation. The other thing is I think that our funding agencies, whether it's uh, the Health Resources and Services Administration or it could be SAMHSA or the CDC, um, Largely, a lot of them were, were waiting for the Affordable Care Act and the election and certain 
closure and confirmation on a lot of things actually happening. But I say don't wait for funding announcements or for requests for, announce for applications to come out. You can start working on this stuff now. And today is not too late. Great. And let me remind participants that uh, we won't be able to get through all the questions. However, in your screen you can see my contact information and I can filter that information to, to the presenters. Um, also, one of the resources I want to mention is that you can always access our services uh, to further either strategize or help you assess uh, your agency's uh, ability to conduct mergers. Um, I have a couple of more questions here that Will funding for case management be in jeopardy with the changes we anticipate? Well, uh, yeah, when you say funding, I, I assume you mean, you know, maybe you have federal funding for, for case management services. But I think that, you know, once again, for example, I know that's the situation in California and specifically within California, um, the uh, Los Angeles experience in our planning council. And I can say those are the things right now, Keisha talked about advocacy that you want to advocate for is what will be those wraparound services. So, you know, we're in the midst of this right now, but I obviously am not the person in Washington with a, with a you know, telling the future about what the future funding will look like. Um, I think that, will, you know, medical case management will, could be one of the wraparound services that will be available. Dental, adult dental care will be a wraparound service that's available. Um, and some planning councils, I know Houston and Los Angeles are even talking about vision care as a wraparound service, for example. And also, right. this is AJ, I wanted to add uh, something too about terminology. I think that's a great question. And, you know, I think as we can see in our field, a lot of times we change the names of things and we name the same thing something else. So, so for example, maybe case management, um, non-clinical case management for, I'm sorry, yeah, for example, might not be funded in the way that it used to, but if you look at kind of peer navigation, for example, patient navigation, that is inclusive of what we consider case management. So you, you might want to think about reframing. If you say you, you have a strong case management program, rethink that and maybe evolve that into a peer navigation program, which is potentially much more likely to be funded. So I think with all of the, you know, terminology is always changing, but I think it's really important to look at what funders are funding, and often it's something it is what you're doing, but it's called something else. All right, and I'm going to post the last question. I want to remind participants that once they close their window, a uh, survey is going to come up, and question number eight is an open-ended question where you can uh, add any type of questions that we didn't address during this presentation, and we'll follow up with, uh, with an educational material that would answer those questions. The last question that I have here for today is, can we do temporary mergers with the purpose of in to increase our capacity and then split? No. Uh, no. You, this, without knowing any more detail, my immediate response would be no. You, you wouldn't go through the process of a temporary merger. A merger is, is, is much more permanent. Um, one of the other methods that we, that we mentioned was the parent subsidiary corporation, which is can potentially be used as a precursor to a merger if there's some sort of holdup that's preventing two agencies from merging. Uh, but without knowing further detail, a merger is not a method that you would use on a temporary basis. You might do some programmatic collaboration instead if it was program specific, but you wouldn't temporarily merge two agencies. Great. I want to thank the participants and, and the facilitators for today's webinar and for participating in the webinar today. We know that, every, uh, that there's a lot of questions that remain to be answered, and we do encourage you to get in contact with us to respond to those uh, questions. We also encourage you to visit our website where we have a list uh, and a sort of resources that are available to you for free uh, that could supplement what today's presentation has covered. And once again, thank you to the facilitators, and we look forward to seeing the participants once again in a future webinar. Thank Great. you, everybody. Thank you, Oscar, and thank you, everyone else, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.